everybody and uh, welcome to the webinar. Thanks for joining today. So as Anna said, I'm going to um, give an overview of um, protein function in the Uniprot resource. Uh, so the talk is divided into two parts. So in the first part, I'll give an introduction to the resource and I'll also explain how we add information uh, to Uniprot. And then in the second part of the talk, I'll show you how you can find this information on the Uniprot website. So Uniprot is a resource of protein sequence and functional information, and it provides a comprehensive and high quality protein data. All of the information um, in Uniprot is freely available um, from the Uniprot website at uniprot.org, and it's released every eight weeks. And Uniprot is produced by um, a consortium, which is made up of groups at EMBO EBI in the UK at the Swiss Institute of Bioinformatics in Geneva in Switzerland, and at the Protein Information Resource, which is based at um, Georgetown University and the University of Delaware in the US. So why use Uniprot? Well, there's a huge amounts of um, protein data being generated, which are really difficult um, to keep up with for um, researchers. And so Uniprot can help with that. So Uniprot aims to collect all of this information and to compile it into um, a high quality resource. Um, it also aids scientific discovery by organizing all of this information and making it easy to access and to use. And it also saves researchers huge amounts of time in having to um, monitor this information for themselves and collect this information for themselves. And as well as providing um, a huge amount of protein data, Uniprot also provides tools to help with protein sequence analysis, so tools like BLAST and uh, sequence alignment tools. And as well as the information that's provided directly by Uniprot, and there are also links to over 180 other resources, which means that um, users can start at Uniprot and then jump to other databases to find um, other related information, perhaps in more specialized collections. So um, the sequence data in Uniprot are organized into a number of resources. So the Uniprot um, resource is a sequence archive that includes um, protein sequences from um, the publicly available uh, resources. The um, Uniref uh, database clusters protein sequences at various um, levels of sequence identity, so at 100, 90, and 50% identity. Um, access to complete proteomes is provided through the Uniprot proteomes portal. And, um, and really the centerpiece of, the, um, of Uniprot is the Uniprot knowledge base. And so this is the, the resource that I'll be concentrating on for the rest of the talk today. So within the Uniprot knowledge base, there are two data sets, um, Swissprot and Tremble. But the Swissprot section is a reviewed section. So all of the information in Swissprot is manually reviewed by a team of curators. And the data comes mainly from scientific literature. And that's also combined with results, um, manually reviewed results from computational sequence analysis. And the unreviewed Tremble section, there's no manual review of the data. So the protein sequences are imported from um, a range of sequence repositories, and then additional data is um, added, which is generated from computational pipelines. So where do um, all of these protein sequences come from? Well, the vast majority uh, come from translations of coding regions in the nucleotide sequences, which are submitted to the databases of the INSDC. So INSDC is the International Nucleotide Sequence Database Collaboration, and that's made up of ENA at uh, EMBL EBI, which is the European Nucleotide Archive, um, GenBank at the NCBI in the US, and the DNA Data Bank of Japan. And as well as um, sequences from these resources, we also import sequences from a number of resources that do their own gene predictions, such as Ensemble and RefSeq, uh, we also import sequences from the Protein Data Bank uh, to ensure that we have a representative in Uniprot for um, any protein where uh, there's a, a structure available. And uh, we also accept um, submissions of directly sequenced proteins um, and we provide accession numbers for them that can be used by uh, researchers in their publications. And then um, 
we have a team of curators who take these unreviewed tremble records and add a, um, a whole slew of information uh, before these entries make their way into the SwissPot section, as well as continuously updating existing SwissPot records as new information becomes available. Uh, so Uniprot, like I say, provides a huge amount of information, but it is a sequence database. And so there is a lot of effort put into making sure that um, the sequences that are provided are as accurate as possible. And so uh, the first step in the curation process is to make sure that the sequence is correct. Um, all, so any sequence reports related to the same gene from the same organism are merged into a single SwissPot record. And uh, we make sure that the sequence matches the genome, if there is a, a genome, a, a complete genome available, and uh, correct any errors in the sequences if necessary, um, and document any discrepancies uh, between uh, multiple sequence reports. And these might be due to um, naturally occurring events, so things like an alternative splicing, or to um, sequencing errors. So the curators will go back and look into things like the nucleotide sequence to identify if there are frame shifts in the sequence. And all of this work makes sure that the, the sequences we provide are correct and also uh, increases the accuracy of any further sequence analysis during the curation process. Uh, so we use a range of sequence analysis programs um, to predict various um, regions and sites of importance within the protein sequence. So things like um, post-translational modifications, transmembrane regions, um, identification of important domains within the sequence. And all of the predictions are manually reviewed and only relevant results which um, make biological sense are selected for inclusion. And these predictions are coupled with experimental data that's extracted from the, the literature to provide a complete overview of um, the important features of a particular protein sequence. And a, a huge part of the um, curation process is literature curation. And this is uh, really important um, because in this, during this process, published results from the scientific literature are extracted and converted into a format which can be both easily understood by users, but is also um, computationally usable. Uh, and data is combined from multiple papers and also from other sources and um, it allows us to highlight any conflicting data uh, or and we can uh, any correct any potentially erroneous data and provide a complete overview of um, a particular research area. So during the curation, the literature curation step, um, experimental findings from the literature are evaluated and all of this information is compiled into a comprehensive report to give an overview of um, protein functional information. And where possible, the information is represented using controlled vocabularies. And all of the information that's extracted from the literature is linked back to the original publications so that it's clear where the information has come from. So how do we find literature? So we have a number of ways that we um, look for um, papers to add to the resource. So we monitor new publications coming out in a number of high impact journals. And we also have a very active user community who um, often suggest uh, papers to add. Uh, we make use of um, papers um, in what we call our additional bibliographies. These are papers that haven't been curated by the Uniprop curators, but are pulled in from other resources. Um, we also allow, um, we have a tool that allows uh, for community submission of literature, and I'll say a little bit more about that later. Uh, we search literature databases and we also make use of um, text mining tools. So two of the tools that we have been using are um, Puptator and LitSuggest. Uh, so um, both of these are text mining tools that have been developed at uh, the NCBI and uh, we use Puptator for uh, our weekly literature triage. This really helps us when we're looking through these high impact journals to quickly identify relevant papers for curation. And LitSuggest um, has been, is very useful in identifying domain specific literature. So we have been using that um, with some success to identify uh, literature reporting um, new enzyme reactions and also to identify um, papers reporting um, variants within protein sequences. 
And during the curation process, there's a, a huge amount of information is added from the scientific literature. The curators collect uh, protein and gene names from the paper. Papers. They also um, extract information about the function of a protein for enzymes. They will, um, we will look for information about what um, reactions are being catalyzed and if any cofactors are required, uh, where in the cell a protein is, uh, is located and in what tissues it's expressed. Does it interact with other proteins? Uh, is it alternatively spliced? And also information is extracted from papers uh, related to uh, features of the protein sequence. So any domains or regions of importance, any site binding sites or any sites which are post-translationally modified or which are important for um, catalysis. And all of this information is compiled from multiple papers and it's organized. And um, so curators really add value to the data by compiling it from different resources and organizing it in a way that makes it easy for users to access. Um, so obviously manual expert curation is a really key um, key for providing high quality information. And um, but the rate of um, protein or uh, nucleotide sequencing is continuing to increase. So we continue to have huge numbers of new sequences entering the database. So the unreviewed tremble section is continuing to grow. And so manual curation, can't keep up with this huge um, influx of sequences. And also many of these sequences haven't been characterized. So there is no um, published data available for them. So it's important that we have ways to um, enhance the information coming in for these records, for these proteins which haven't been characterized. And so to do that, we use a number of um, automated systems. Uh, so we have a system called UniRU, um, where so this is a rule-based system where although the system itself is applied automatically, the rules are manually created by curators. And um, UniRule uh, makes use of um, interpro to group um, related proteins together. And it also makes use of the high quality information in the Swiss prop section. And so by uh, looking by using interpro, um, we can see related proteins and we can see what information they share in the Swiss prot section and then rules can be created so that that information can be applied to related proteins in the unreviewed tremble section. And we also have a second system called ARBA which is completely automated and ARBA is a, a rule mining um, technique uh, which applies information in a completely automated way. And as well as using these two systems um, there is <clears throat> automated sequence analysis done on the entries in the unreviewed section to predict sequence features, so things like signal sequences, transmembrane regions, coiled coils, and intrinsically disordered regions. And then um, there's also an um, addition of um, domains within the protein sequence, and that's based on information provided by um, Interpro member databases, uh, ProSite, SMART, and PFAM. And a recent development in this area is in automatic protein naming. So um, UniProt has been collaborating with Google Research who've developed um, a method to um, name proteins. And this method is now being applied to uncharacterized proteins um, to generate protein names. And so at the bottom of the slide here, you can see that this is a, an unreviewed record which in a previous release would have just been called uncharacterized protein, which is not very informative, but it now has a, a proper protein name thanks to this, um, this new method. And so that this method is now providing protein names for over 40 million of the, the records in the unreviewed tremble section. So as you can see from the previous slides, um, the data in UniProt comes from a variety of different sources. So there's information coming from scientific literature, from researchers, from computational pipelines, information that's pulled in from other databases. And so it's really important that users of the resource can tell where all of this information has come from. So um, to allow this, we link all of the information in Uniprop back to its original source. And to do this, we use um, the evidence and conclusion ontology, or ECO for short. So ECO is an ontology that's been developed um, to provide information about the sources of biological assertions. 
Um, so, for example, if a, a paper shows that a particular protein acts as a, a tyrosine kinase, then using ECO, we can um, link that, that function to that protein. And also, uh, so we can provide information about the source of the information of, the, of the, the function and also the fact that this um, information has been experimentally determined. And later on, I will show you how this is represented on the, the website. So just to summarize um, the first part of the talk, so Uniprot uh, KB or Uniprot Knowledge Base is composed of two different sections. There's the reviewed Swissprot section, which contains just over half a million records, and the unreviewed Tremble section, which is much larger, has almost, uh, almost 230 million records. And the reviewed um, Swissprot section, the information comes primarily from scientific literature, and this information is combined with um, manually reviewed results from sequence analysis tools. Uh, whereas in the unreviewed Tremble section, the information is completely automatic. It comes from a number of different pipelines, including our UniRule and ARBA pipelines, as well as further automated sequence analysis. And all of the data in both sections is linked back to its original source. So I'm going to move on to the second part of the talk now and show you, so having showed you how the information is added to the resource, I'll now show you how you can find this information um, in Uniprot on using on the Uniprot website. So this um, is a screenshot of the homepage of the website that, um, at uniprot.org. And you can see there's a search box here. So you can, um, it supports both simple and advanced searches if you want to do more complex queries. Um, if you have something like a gene name or a protein name, you can just add it into the, the search box and retrieve your protein of interest. Uh, and this shows um, uh, what the, uh, an entry view for a particular protein. So this protein is MTMR2, myotubularin-related protein from human, which is um, it's a phosphatase. And you can see that there's a, a menu across the top of the page, and you can use this menu to choose how you want to view the entry. And there's also um, a, a list of a quick, quick access tabs along the left-hand side of the page, and these allow you to explore specific sections of the entry, so you can jump to sections of interest. So, for example, to uh, access information about the function of the protein, you can click on the function tab. And you'll see at the top, you get a, a free text description about the function of the protein. And this has been compiled from um, multiple papers. And this, uh, so MTMR2, as I said, is a phosphatase, so it's an enzyme. So there's information provided about um, which reactions it catalyzes. And, um, and there's also links to source publications so that you can see exactly where this information has been shown. Um, so if you're interested in looking at the enzyme reaction, you can click on a reaction participant to access further information. Uh, so for example, to um, see information about that reaction participant in the KEBI resource. And if you want to see um, which publications the information has come from, then you can click on the publications tab to access the full publication details. And when you click on that, it will open and you'll get a list of the papers which have been used um, as the sources for that information. And for each paper, there are links um, back to PubMed and to Europe BMC. And also, if the paper has been used in other um, entries in Uniprot, you can also um, see those and click on those and retrieve those entries as well. Um, so as well as providing a free text um, overview of the function of the protein, which is um, very easy to understand um, as, as a, for, for reading, but is not, is not really um, easy to extract computationally. We also um, provide an overview of the role of the protein using um, the gene ontology. So gene ontology is a controlled vocabulary of um, terms which are describe the molecular functions and biological processes which a protein is involved in, as well as um, what, what uh, whereabouts in the cell the protein is located. And we there's a, a, a nice overview provided using um, this, what's called this Go ribbon, which um, 
provides a summary of the functions and processes and uh, cellular components um, for the for this particular protein. And these are um, there's a, a selection of high level go terms, uh, so you get an, a, and a summary of of the, an overview of the role of the protein. And then it, as well as this overview, there are also all of the specific go terms which have been linked to this protein are also provided. And the source details are provided for, for each go term. So Uniproc curators assign go terms as part of the curation process. And Uniprot also imports go terms from other member databases of the Gene Ontology Consortium. And these are all compiled together. And so you can see for each term where the term has come from and which resource has provided the term. Uh, if you're interested in seeing whereabouts in the cell the protein is active, then you can go to the subcellular location section. And um, this will give a list of locations where the protein um, has been found. And you can hover over a location to see it highlighted uh, in the, the picture of the cell. And, you, and that location will also be described. And these, um, the, the pictures themselves are um, from Swiss Biopix, which is a resource that's been developed at the Swiss Institute of Bioinformatics. So it's a freely available uh, resource of um, images of different cell types and these can also be used in other resources so, so that's free to use they can be embedded in other websites as well um, if you're interested in where um, which tissues a particular protein is expressed in there are links provided to specialized expression resources and uniprot curators also capture this, this kind of information from the literature and if you're interested in going further you can click on a particular link to a another database. So in this case, this is the Human Protein Atlas, and you get a nice overview of whereabouts um, this, in which tissues this protein is expressed. There's also information provided in the disease and drugs section about um, any diseases um, that a particular protein is involved in. So in this case, MTMR2 uh, is um, variants in this protein cause a disease called Charcot-Marie Tooth disease, which is a, a disorder of the peripheral nervous system. So there's the a description of the, the disease itself with links to the MIM resource. So as I say, so you can find information about these diseases which are associated with genetic variants. And the genetic variants themselves are also provided in a, there's both a graphical overview and a, a table view. Um, you can filter um, the, the variants based on their consequence and also on their, their provenance. So um, these variants are, are consist of variants which are captured from the literature by Uniproc curators and which are also incorporated from large scale um, vari variation resources. So, um, Uniprot, in addition to capturing this information from the literature, pulls in variants from a number of other uh, variant databases, and all of this is compiled together. And so you can see in the table at the bottom uh, a list of the variants and whether they're associated with the disease or not, and um, whereabouts they, which database they've been um, abstracted from. Uh, and just um, to show you how automatic annotation is represented in an entry, so the, the entry we've been looking at was MTMR2 uh, in human, which is well characterized. This is the orthologous uh, protein from the horse, where it's not so well characterized. But um, the information that has been added manually to the human entry can then be propagated uh, through, <coughs> excuse me, through automatic annotation systems to this unreviewed record. And you can see, so I'll just go back here, well, you can see that the evidence is showing that this comes from automatic annotation. And if you click on that, it will tell you which system has supplied the information. Um, as well as all of the information that's provided directly within Uniprot, there is easy access provided to information in other resources. So I mentioned that Uniprot links to more than 100 and other, uh, 180 other databases. So by clicking on this external links um, at, tab at the top of the page, you can you will be taken to a list of um, links to a whole host of other databases. So you can um, 
explore um, the information in those databases as well related to a particular protein. But if you're interested in exploring important domains or sites in the protein sequence, you can go to the family and domains tab and this will give a list of um, important domains and regions um, and sites within the protein sequence. Uh, you can view them all or you can uh, restrict your view to a particular type if you don't want to see all of them. Uh, also, there's information provided about residues which um, have been modified. So, for example, in this case, you can see here that there's information about phosphorylated residues. And in this case, this hasn't come from the literature. This has been um, propagated by similarity to another characterized protein. And if you click on that, again, you'll be shown where um, the information comes from. So you can trace it back to the experimentally characterized um, protein where, where the phosphorylation was originally shown. Um, Another way to view, a really nice way to view all of the uh, protein features together is to use the feature viewer. And there's a, a link provided again in the tabs across the top of the, uh, the entry. And this is a, a graphical viewer for um, sequence features, which shows all of the features together in a single view. So for example, here you can see that um, there is an active site at residue 417. And being able to see all of these features together can um, shed light and provide information that is, is not always obvious when you view these, um, these uh, pieces of information in isolation. Like I say, there's an active site at residue 417, and there's also a variant um, at, uh, at the same position. And, um, and knowing that this variant coincides with the um, active site of this enzyme can then start to shed light about why this particular variant may be deleterious for the, the function of the protein. And the feature viewer also includes an interactive um, 3D structure viewer. So if there are structures available for the protein, then you will see, um, you can see the, the structure there and the, the links to um, PDB and RCSB um, and other structure resources. And you can highlight particular features that you're interested in on the structure and see where they lie within the, the 3D structure. If there's no um, structure available for the protein, then um, you can view um, the, if it's available, the alpha fold prediction. So for example, you just move to a different um, protein here. Uh, Claren 2, where there is no available structure. So in this case, the alpha fold prediction has been shown so that you can still get an overview of the 3D structure of the protein, even if there is no experimentally solved structure. Um, and if you're interested in um, exploring the literature associated with the protein um, and knowing where um, the information and entry comes from, you can do that using the publications tab at the top of the entry view. And if you click on that, you will get taken to a page which lists all of the publications for that particular entry. And these are divided into two sections. So there's the list of papers which have actually been curated um, by the Unicroc curators. And these are the papers that have been used as sources of information in the entry. And there's also a second section for what we call computationally mapped publications. And these are papers that haven't been used during the curation process, but they have been imported from other resources. And so this uh, provides a way of allowing users to more fully explore the, the whole range of papers that are available for a particular protein. For papers that have actually been curated um, during the Unicroc curation process, um, there's a list of what um, has been cited, why that paper has been cited, so the information that that paper has provided to the entry. And you can also filter the publications based on the category and also on the study type. So, for example, if you want to look only at small scale papers and to exclude uh, large scale uh, papers, you can do that. For the papers which have been imported from other resources, these are um, categorized and the source of each paper is provided. 
So for example, in this case, there's this paper has been um, imported from Intact, uh, which is a resource which um, stores information about protein um, interactions. And, and I also mentioned earlier that we um, provide a way of um, community submission of publications. So um, anyone is free to add a publication. So if you notice that um, a publication is missing, you can submit that, that paper yourself using the add a publication link, which again is found near the top of the entry view. And that will take you to um, a submission page where you can provide details. You need, you need an ORCID ID to authenticate the submission, um, but also then that, that submission will be linked to your ORCID and so that you can get acknowledgement of credit for that on the, the UniProp website. So the community submitted papers do appear in the publication section. And um, so this uh, screenshot just shows an example of how this is um, viewed on the website. And um, so there's a paper here that has been provided by, um, you know, through this, this, this route and it links to the, the ORCID ID of um, the submission of the paper. Uh, so just to, to summarize, so Uniprop provides uh, a wide range of functional information from um, a variety of sources, including scientific literature, um, sequence analysis programs, various automatic annotation systems, and um, in information that's been imported from other databases. And all of the information is linked back to its original source. So you can tell whether information has come from the scientific literature or from um, an automatic annotation method. Um, and all of the information is made freely available um, from the Uniprop website at uniprop.org. To access the Uniprop data, um, like I say, everything is freely available from the website. The release uh, happens every eight weeks and the data is provided in um, a range of different formats. Um, the website itself supports uh, both simple and complex queries. And it's also um, possible to access the data programmatically. So I've given a link there um, if anybody's interested in more details about um, programmatic access to the data. Um, if you want to keep up with the developments in Uniprot, um, we do have a blog where we regularly publish um, uh, articles about um, interesting new things that are happening in the resource. And we're also on Twitter and on Facebook. Um, to get um, help with anything, um, if you're stuck with anything on the website, there is a help link in the top right hand corner and also down in the center of the of the, the home page and on every page um, of the website. And there's also a feedback form. So if you have any feedback on the website itself, you can um, provide that there. And clicking on the help link uh, will take you to the help center. And there's a search box there. So you can, um, if you're having trouble with something, you can, um, that's a good first point is to just use the search box and see if you can find what you're looking for. Uh, if not, then uh, please do feel free to get in touch. So we do have a very active help desk and we're very happy to answer queries if people are having problems um, or just uh, yeah, want to want help with them um, retrieving a particular kind of information, then yes, do get in touch with us. And uh, I'd just like to acknowledge the work of the, the Uniprop team. The Uniprop, like I said, is a big team uh, spread across a number of sites. and. Um, so I'd just like to acknowledge the work of all of the curators and the developers who are involved in producing Uniprot. And uh, also just to thank our funders who make all of the work that we do possible. And uh, before I finish up, I'll just mention that there will be, um, if anybody is particularly interested in how, in learning more about the automated annotation in Uniprot, then there will be a webinar on that topic on the 8th of December. And so if you're interested in learning more about that, then yeah, please do sign up for that webinar. And yes, that's it. So yeah, thanks for thanks for um, listening. And uh, I'm happy to take any questions if anybody has any questions. Great, thank you, Michelle. Um, so we do have a couple of questions obviously just to, to mention again if you do think of questions after this webinar don't worry this isn't your only chance to ever contact someone from the uniprop team you can always contact them as michelle said through the uh, help desk on the website so we have um we have a couple of questions 
I th- if I'm understanding the first one correctly, the the question is if you have a, a sequence but you're not sure which protein it is, can you identify a function from from just that information? Yeah, so I mean, I guess there are a number of things you can do. I mean, something that's really simple to do is that you can take the sequence and um, go to the Uniprot website and run a blast search and see if you hit anything similar. You might uh, find that your sequence that is similar to something else and perhaps using, based on the sequence similarity, you can maybe draw some conclusions about the function of the protein. Um, you can also um, use things like um, Interpro is a good, a good resource as well. So you can have a look and see if there are any domains um, uh, of, of interest. Um, I, I mean, I guess it depends how far you would like to go. Um, I mean, there is um, the, the, so Uniprot does um, provide the, uh, a system that you can run over your own proteins to try and predict um, the function of the protein. Um, and that's uh, that's available if that's if that's of interest. Then um, yes, that that's also something that you can do if you have you, know, you can run the systems yourself. Right, thank you. Um, so there's I think uh, a couple of questions around PDB and AlphaFold. So do you do you link Uniprop with PDB? I think you maybe mentioned this before. Um, yeah so exactly. yeah so we we um yes we do so for any any entry in uniprot where there is a structure in pdb we have a cross reference from uniprot to the corresponding um pdb record um and that's done through a project called sifts which um tries to maintain links between um uniprot and pdb so, and we do have um, a curator within the group who uh, yeah, takes care of, of mapping between the two resources. So yeah, so for every every, every um, protein that has a solved structure, we'll have a link to the, the corresponding PDB record. Right, thank you. And I think just to clarify as well, someone else asked about 3D structures. So that's that's the, the PDB link there. So mm -hmm. recommend going and taking a look at uh, PDB, the Protein Data Bank in Europe for more information around that and um if, if you do want to learn a bit more about that on the training website there's a, a couple of uh online tutorials that you can go through that will tell you a bit more about what pdb does um i think this one's perhaps a little a little far from from a unipro answer but maybe you have some <laughs> some thoughts on it um how do you identify genes or I suppose proteins of a particular disease or disorder i think perhaps some of the databases you mentioned um, are good places to start for those yeah i mean we so um, we do capture that information from the scientific literature so we we focus mainly on um on um the yeah, mendelian uh, disorders so um yes we have lots of information about um proteins which have variants and um, those variants are um, causing diseases and most of that information is coming directly from the scientific literature and then we do have links to other disease uh, resources as well right sorry just answering someone else's question there um and uh the next question i wanted to have a a quick look at well someone was asking about the way to download machine readable files multiple files and you mentioned um the programmatic access before yeah so um i guess it depends what you want to do it's you can you can query the database programmatically um you can also using the advanced um search on the website um retrieve a particular set of proteins and download them as well without having to go through the programmatic um uh, access um, so if there's, I can see the question, yes, is there a way to download? So I would say, yes, there is. Um, it depend, de what, depending on what you want to do and what kind of information you're looking for, there are probably multiple ways to do it. If you have um, a specific query, you can always use the, yeah, maybe you can send it through to our help desk and we can help you that way. And we can, if it's a particular query that can be done on the website, then we can, we can send you the query to do that. 
Great, thank you. And if it is um, more programmatic access that you're interested in, there's a, a link in the chat to a recent webinar recording um, of, of programmatic access of Unipro. So that may be of interest to you. Um, so we just have one question, uh, which is a very interesting question, I think. Um, so what happens if um, a, a curator sees something that needs correcting? Is that something that they do? And if there's a conflict with what's in the literature, how's that handled? Yeah, so, so, so yes, we, we do. Um, so if a paper is retracted, then obviously we will remove the information. Um, we will flag the paper as uh, having you know, being being a retraction, and we will put something into the entry to explain why that information has been removed. So to say that originally the protein was thought to do X, but then the paper was retracted. And I think that's the easy case when it's a very clear cut case that something has been shown to be really erroneous, and the paper has actually been retracted. Um, it's less clear cut, I think, when. Um, Yes, two papers just report conflicting information and it's there isn't really confirmation of one or the other. And in that case, if we really can't decide, we will we'll put both papers in and we will put both pieces of information in and we will highlight that um, to say that yeah, there's conflicting information and that uh, yeah, so that users can then make up their minds. Um, because sometimes there just isn't enough information to be able to mean one way or another. So I think at that point, it just leads me to say thank you very much to Michelle for coming along and uh, talking to us today um, and to all of you for joining us and asking your questions.